This is On Campus on Radio Adelaide 101.5 FM. I'm Ewart Shaw, and like many people, I really enjoy crime programs on television. But we have a mystery here in Adelaide, a mystery going back to Somerton Beach 61 years ago. And now, Professor Derek Abbott, who you'll normally find surrounded by electrical and electronic engineering students, is working on it. I spoke to him and asked him what, in his view, is the story here. Basically, the story is um, a man was found dead on Somerton Beach in 1948, um, uh, on November the 30th, and uh, the police could find <coughs> no trace of his identity on him. Um, he had no marks on his body, no sign, obvious signs of violence or death. And so it was a complete mystery. Um, when they f tried to follow up things like his dental records and his fingerprints, no nothing came up. And so they have no idea who this guy is to this day. And they have no idea how he died as well. It's suspected it was poisoning, but um, no poison was detected at the time. Uh, what makes this case doubly mysterious is that then six months later, uh, when Professor John Cleland, who was a professor of pathology here at Adelaide University in 49, was asked to review the case, he um, looked through the man's clothes and possessions as part of his investigation and found something the police had missed. He found a tiny little piece of rolled up paper in one of the guy's pockets, tightly jammed in there. And, that, uh, and he unrolled the bit of paper and it said the, these mysterious words, Taman should. And he didn't know what that meant, meant, and he, and the police didn't know what that, or what the meaning of this was either. And uh, <coughs> so they published this in the advertiser the following day um, to ask the public if anyone knew what this was. And uh, it, uh, funnily enough, a guy called Frank Kennedy, um, who was a um, newspaper reporter himself, came forward and he says, "Yep." This, these are the words out of uh, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, right at the end of the book. And so immediately the police published that and went searching around all of Adelaide and in libraries to see if they could find a copy where these words had been ripped out of the back of because um, the words that were in the man's pocket were printed and they had looked if they were, that they were ripped out of a book. Uh, so they couldn't find such a book. However, a gentleman came forward a um, uh, couple of weeks later because he had read about this in the newspapers and he says, as a matter of fact, um, six months ago I found this book. Uh, somebody had tossed it into my car. Uh, this was a guy that had a car with a soft top. It had no roof, so somebody had just thrown it in and he had thought nothing of it. And uh, uh, until he had read the newspaper article and realized the significance of it. So he handed it in to the police, and lo and behold, the back page had been ripped, and the words Tam and Should had been ripped out. And uh, so this was the book. Uh, the police matched the piece of paper to the book. So this is the book that belonged to the dead man. And the strange thing is, in the back of the book, was likely penciled a secret code, or what appeared to be a secret code. And that's where you come in. Yes, and for 60 years, no one has been able to crack this code. And so I thought it'd be rather fun to set it as an honors project for my students. Um, and so they've been doing it uh, this year and having a go at um, looking at this code and the nature of it. So what I, the task I've set them is to... Uh, not necessarily crack the code, obviously, because uh, I don't expect them to do all that in an honours project if no one else has been able to do it for 60 years. But what I've said to them is I want them to use what we teach them in engineering, uh, the, the uh, use the mathematical and statistical techniques and techniques in information theory that they've been taught, to try and find out about the nature of this code, the statistics of it, you know, 
uh, do the letters follow the statistics of um, of a language, or, and if so, which language uh, is it? Uh, the letters from the body of a language, or is it the initial letters? And you, you, there are statistical tests you can perform to to give give you clues about the nature of it. So this is that what they're tasked with is to really find the nature of it, and then once we've found its nature, perhaps we can have a better idea how to crack it um, at some later date, but I don't expect them to do that all this year. Now, if we go back to 1948, there was, in those immediate post-war years, an influx into Australia of people, especially from Central and Eastern Europe. Yes. There were a great many people whose identity papers had been lost anywhere as, as a result of the war, who were traveling on Red Cross passports. Um, and of course, also, uh, a lot of you know, espionage, secret agents. This is not just a murder mystery. The fact that all his identification had been taken away, you suspect somebody, maybe he, hmm. was trying to hide his identity, or somebody, maybe they, wanted to ensure that he wasn't identified. Yes, I have thought about this, and <clears throat> it's in a sense it's not surprising he didn't have any ID, because remember this is 48, and you weren't required in those days to ha walk around with your driver's license or something like that, which we are today. And, I mean, not everyone drove then either. So uh, it's n not that unusual for him not to have ID, what is unusual, however, is that all the labels were ripped off his clothes, um, all the clothing labels. So we aren't able to look at his clothes and say, okay, this is the origin of where he bought them from. So uh, that, that clue has been taken away from us. And so this what is what gives it that element of a spy mystery. Because uh, there are various cases in the Cold War of spies being found and um, and having their clothing labels removed. Uh, so th this is something we do associate with spies. But the question is, is, is that melodramatic? Is that really the case for this guy? Or could it be that he just bought his clothes from a charity shop um, or something like that where the labels happen to be removed? That, that is another possibility some people have put forward. But, um, you know, when I look around in charity shops, I don't see that the labels are necessarily ripped off. I, I don't see that that's necessary a logical conclusion there. So <clears throat> the, 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 the removing of labels for a spy hypothesis does seem to be a little bit more attractive to, to me. Now, we uh, are expected to carry around a lot more identification now than people were in 1948. We can just walk through a railway station and we're picked up on half a dozen security cameras. This is the sort of surveillance that wasn't around in 1948. Exactly. At that yep. time, the police must have asked questions. Have you seen this man? Somebody must have seen him that day, the day before. Someone in Adelaide must have recognized this person. Yes, well, the police did go to a lot of efforts at the time. I think they checked all the local boarding houses. Um, they even um, <clears throat> they even tracked down the tram conductor who um, sold him the ticket uh, that took the man from uh, the centre of Adelaide down to the beach where he was found dead. Um, I, I forgot if I mentioned he was found dead on a beach at the beginning, but uh, that's a little detail. So he he had travelled through Adelaide, and so they, they 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 the police did track down people, but of course they 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 couldn't remember anything. He was just a man, a face in a crowd, and um, and of course his picture was published in the advertising newspaper. Um, his his. Um, post-mortem picture showing his face and no one came forward to identify him no one said oh this is my my husband or my son or anything he seemed to have no close relatives that came forward and were able to recognize him some uh, hundred people did come forward thinking they knew him and they were taken to the mortuary to see the dead body and for one one reason or another, each case was eliminated. They were, it was found it wasn't their relative for whatever reason. And so uh, to this day, uh, we have no one who's been able to identify him.
Nowadays, of course, we've got lots and lots of other techniques of identification. DNA, for example, is a very Correct, good way of, yeah. of, of, of assessing people's relationships to each other. And, mm. and I've heard you speak of a, of a website which helps you sort of, you put up your DNA and they can track cousins, the fifth and sixth generation all over the world. Correct. H have, we, have we thought of something like that to find this man's relatives? Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, what the, th the thing uh, that really reopens this case 60 years later is that we now have this technology and so it's a fantastic way that wasn't available before to actually find his identity. So what we can do is uh, if we apply uh, to disinter his body, uh, we could um, uh, extract the DNA from his teeth, for example. We could put it on this website and the website will then attempt to match his DNA with um, some various other people around the world, you know, out of a pool of hundreds of thousands of people that are on there. And it will show us what the closest matches are. And I'm, I, I think this is the next step. This is what we should do because, you see, if uh, the top 20 matches, for example, are all names that end in Ovsky, the Russian spy hypothesis somehow starts to look attractive. Um, so just by the, the surnames of the people that he matches with uh, could give us a lot of clues as to his origin. And I do think, and I love, I love solving mysteries, and I think it's such a shame that here is someone who came to Adelaide for whatever purpose, uh, never left, and is a, you know, an, a, sort of a grave in West Terrace Cemetery and there's nobody to claim him. That's right. And uh, if we could find his family, that would be very interesting uh, because maybe there is some family history that goes back to, to him that some living relatives might know about. And they may be to this day assuming that he was just somebody that was lost in the war and never thought to look at the fact that he died mysteriously in Australia and never connected the two things. So through his DNA, we may put somebody, some family strife to rest. Professor Derek Abbott talking about the Somerton mystery and the University of Adelaide's involvement in a possible solution. And I will be talking to his students a little later this year to see if they've finally worked out what that code was. But that's the show for today. I'm Ewart Shaw. Thank you very much for your company. Please do join me again at the same time next week for more news of the intellectual, cultural and social life of the University of